Since Michael Bond started writing his stories about a bear from darkest Peru, Paddington has become the most popular bear of modern times. He's called Paddington because he was found on Paddington Station by Mr. and Mrs. Brown, and he lives with the Browns and their children, Judy and Jonathan, and their housekeeper, Mrs. Bird, at 32 Windsor Gardens in London. Paddington has many adventures, and those you're going to hear now all come from the book Paddington Marches On. One morning, just as the Browns were sitting down to breakfast, a large rat-tat-tat sent Mrs. Bird hurrying to the front door. I didn't want to push these through to let the box, ma'am, said the postman, handing her two large snow-white envelopes, in case anything happened to them. One of them is addressed to that young bear of yours. The Browns' postman had once got one of Aunt Lucy's postcards stuck in their front door and Paddington had given him some hard stares through the letterbox for several days afterwards. Thanking the man for his trouble, Mrs. Bird hurried back into the dining room, clutching the letters. Paddington nearly dropped the marmalade into his tea when he saw that one was addressed to him. He often received a postcard from Peru, and at least once a week a catalogue arrived bearing his name, but he'd never had anything quite as impressive before. Here, let me, said Mr. Brown, picking up a knife and coming to his rescue. You don't want to get marmalade all over it. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Brown, said Paddington gratefully. Envelopes are a bit difficult, with paws. A gasp of surprise went up from the rest of the family as Mr. Brown cut open the envelope and withdrew a large gold-edged card, which he held up for everyone to see. Whatever can it be? exclaimed Mrs. Brown. It looks most important. Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses. Ah. Uh, Sir Huntley Martin, he read, requests the pleasure of Mr. Paddington Brown's company at two o'clock on Monday the 20th of February. There will be a tour of the factory, followed by an important ceremony and a special tea. Sir Huntley Martin, echoed Mrs. Bird. Isn't he that nice man we met at the Polchester that day Paddington had trouble with his onions? Yeah, that's right, said Judy. He's the Marmalade King. He said at the time that he wanted Paddington to pay him a visit, but that was ages ago. Well, how nice of him to remember, said Mrs. Brown, opening the other envelope. Huh. Trust old Paddington to get himself invited to a marmalade factory, said Jonathan. It's like taking coals to Newcastle. I wonder what the ceremony is. Whatever it is, replied Mrs. Brown, holding up another card, he must have known it's half term. He's invited the rest of us to see it later in the afternoon. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird, looking at Paddington. It's less than a week away, you know. I can see a certain person's going to have a lot of cleaning up to do. Um, perhaps it's a very sticky ceremony, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington hopefully. Mrs. Bird began clearing away the breakfast things. Sticky it may be, she said sternly, but no bear goes visiting from this house in the state you're in at the moment, least of all to a ceremony. You'll have to have a bath and a good going over with the vacuum. Paddington sighed. He always enjoyed going out, but he sometimes wished it didn't involve quite so much fuss being made. It had been arranged that as a special treat, Paddington should go on ahead of the others, and he felt very excited when he climbed into a specially ordered taxi and settled himself in the back seat, together with his suitcase, the invitation card, several maps, and a large thermos of hot cocoa. It was the first time he had ever been quite so far afield on his own, and after waving goodbye to the others, he consulted his map and peered out of the window with interest as the taxi gathered speed on its way through the London streets. Now, on the map, the journey to the factory looked no distance at all, only a matter of inches. But Paddington soon found it was much farther than he had expected. Gradually, however, the tall grey buildings gave way to smaller houses and the familiar red buses grew less in number until at long last the driver turned a corner and brought the taxi to a halt in a side street 
near a group of large buildings. Here we are, Gov, he said. Can't get right up to the gates, I'm afraid, there's a bit of an obstruction, isn't there? But it's only a few yards up the road, can't miss it, just follow your nose. The driver paused and looked down out of his cab with growing concern, as Paddington, after stepping down onto the pavement, began twisting about for several seconds and then suddenly fell over and landed with a bump in the gutter. Yeah, he called anxiously. Are you all right? Well, I think so. Ah, oh, gasped Paddington, feeling himself to make sure. I was only trying to follow my nose, but it kept disappearing. Well, you asked to point it in the right direction to start with, said the driver, as he helped Paddington to his feet and began dusting him down. Come on, you're in a right state and no mistake. Paddington examined himself sadly. His fur which a moment before had been as clean and shiny as a new brush, was now covered in a thick layer of dust, and there were several rather nasty-looking patches of oil on his front as well. Worse still, although he still had tight hold of his suitcase with one paw, the other was completely empty. Oh, I think I've dropped my invitation card down the drain, he exclaimed bitterly. The driver climbed back into his cab. Cool, dear. It's not your day, mate, is it? He said sympathetically. If I were you, I'd get where you're going to as quickly as possible before anything else happens. Paddington hurried off down the road in the direction of an imposing-looking building with a large illuminated jar on its side. As he drew near the entrance, he sniffed several times. There was a definite smell of marmalade in the air, not to mention one or two kinds of jam, and he quickened his steps as he approached a small office to one side of the gates, where a man in uniform was standing. The man eyed Paddington up and down. Oh, we're not taking on any bells at the moment. He said sternly, I should trade the ice cream factory next door. I haven't come to be taken on, exclaimed Paddington hotly, giving the man a hard stare. I've come to see Sir Huntley Martin. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, said the gatekeeper sarcastically. And who are you, pray? Lord Muck is silt. Lord Muck, repeated Paddington. I'm not a lord. I'm Paddington Brown. You've seen yourself in the middle lately, asked the gatekeeper. Lord, you may not be, but mucky, you certainly are. I suppose you uh, <laughs> left your rolls round the corner. My rolls, said Paddington, looking most surprised. I didn't bring any rolls, only some cocoa. I thought I was going to eat here. Here they are, now then, said the gatekeeper, taking a deep breath. They do want no cheek from the legs of you. There's an important ceremony taking place this afternoon. They're opening the new factory building and they have strict instructions to keep the gates clear. We don't want no young, unemployed bears hanging about, letting the place down. If you want a job, he continued, picking up a telephone inside his office, they'll call the foreman. Though what he'll think of it all, I don't know. I mean, it does say, hands wanted on the board. It don't say anything about paws. Paddington looked more and more upset as he listened to the gatekeeper. But I haven't come about a job, he exclaimed, when at long last he could get a word in. I'd been invited to Sir Huntley's ceremony. <laughs> yes, yes, said the gatekeeper disbelievingly. But I suppose you'll tell me next you've uh, <laughs> lost your invitation card. That's right, said Paddington. I had a bit of an accident when I got out of my taxi and it fell down a drain. Now you look said the gatekeeper crossly. Pull the other leg. It's got bells on. It may all sort before. After a free tea, no doubt. The only way you'll get into this factory, my lad, is through the works entrance like anyone else. He turned as a figure came hurrying out of the main building. Now then, here's the foreman. And I'd advise you to watch a step. You don't stand any nonsense, you know. There's a <coughs> young out work bear here, Fred, he called as the foreman reached the gate. They was wondering if you could fix him up. Well, I, I told the Labour Exchange we were a bit short-handed, said the foreman, looking Paddington up and down. But I reckon they must be in a worse state than we are. Eh, uh, 
Do you know anything about uh, marmalade? He added, not unkindly. Oh, yes, said Paddington eagerly. I eat a lot of it at home. Mrs. Bird's always rumbling about my jars. Well, uh, eh, I don't know what to suggest, uh, said the foreman as Paddington returned his gaze very earnestly. Is there uh, anything in particular you'd like to try your uh, paw at? Paddington thought for a moment. I, uh, I think perhaps I'd like to see the chunks department first, he announced. That sounds very interesting. <coughs> uh, sure, uh, the chunks uh, department, uh, mm-hmm, said the foreman, glancing at the gatekeeper. I don't know that we've got uh, what you might call uh, a chunks uh, department, but I could start you off in the barrel section if you like. There's no one working there today. It's where we keep the empty civil orange barrels, he explained, as he led the way across the factory square past several rows of seats and a flower-decorated stand. And they all have to be scrubbed out before they're sent back to Spain, and I, I dare say you'll find plenty of old chunks left in them if you're interested. Paddington, who thought the foreman had said they kept several orange barrels, nearly fell over backwards with astonishment as the man led him into a yard at the side of the factory and he took in the sight before him. Oh, there were big barrels, small barrels, barrels to the left and right of him, barrels in front of him, and barrels which seemed to be piled almost as high as the eye could see. In fact, there were so many, he soon became dizzy trying to count them. You, uh, you don't have to scrub them all, said the foreman encouragingly. Only as uh, many as you can. We pay uh, 3p each for the big ones, uh, 2p for the small. So the more you clean, the more you earn. It's what we call piecework. Three P each, repeated Paddington, hardly able to believe his ears. He'd once scrubbed out Mr. Brown's water butt at Windsor Gardens. It had taken him most of one weekend, but at least at the end of it all, Mr. Brown had given him five P extra bun money. I think perhaps I'd uh, like to try and my pour in the testing department instead, he exclaimed. The foreman gave him a look. Huh, you'll be lucky, he said. You have to work your way up to a job like that. No, your best plan is to start at the bottom. He pointed towards a corner of the yard as he turned to go. There's a brush in that bucket over there and you'll find a hosepipe in the corner. Only no playing about squatting people. There's a famous film star coming to make his footprint in the ceremonial cement today. And if I catch you wandering about, it'll be straight back to the labor exchange and no mistake. Paddington stared after the foreman as he disappeared through the open gates. In the past, he had often found there were days when things seemed to go wrong for no reason at all. But he couldn't remember a day when things had gone quite so badly. In fact, they'd not only gone badly, but they seemed to be getting steadily worse with every passing minute. He gave a deep sigh as he looked round the yard at all the barrels. And then gradually, a thoughtful expression came over his face. He felt sure that when the Browns arrived later in the afternoon, things would begin to sort themselves out. But in the meantime, he wasn't the sort of bear to let a good opportunity slip through his paws. Paddington believed in making the most of things, and it wasn't often he was allowed to play with a hosepipe, let alone be paid to do it, even if it was only 3p a large barrel. A few minutes later, the steady hiss of escaping water began to mingle with the distant roar from the factory. And shortly after that, the sound of rolling barrels added itself to the general noises as Paddington went about his task. Several times during the next hour, the foreman poked his head round the gates to see how things were going. And on the last occasion, he brought the gatekeeper along as well. Well, we've got a good lad there, he said approvingly. Makes a change from some of the layabouts we've been getting lately. The gatekeeper surveyed the small figure inside the yard. (laughs) He said darkly. I can see something else that's going to need a good hose down before the day's out. He nodded towards the factory square where a large crowd had assembled in readiness for the ceremony. I only hope he don't show himself in front of that lot. Sir Huntley will be making his speech any moment now, when he won't want no young bells covered in rich chunks for roaming a belt. 
The gatekeeper addressed his last remarks in a loud voice towards the yard, but Paddington was much too busy to notice what was going on outside. Working in a marmalade factory was a lot more enjoyable than he had expected. Already, most of the small 2P barrels had been cleaned and stacked neatly to one side, and he was feeling very pleased with himself as he sat on his suitcase and made a careful note of the number on a piece of label from an old jar. As the foreman and the gatekeeper hurried back across the square, Paddington took a long drink of cocoa from his thermos flask and then turned his attention to the huge mound of threepenny barrels at the back of the yard. He looked up at them doubtfully. Cleaning the two pea barrels had been fairly easy. Apart from the odd few with particularly difficult chunks stuck to the bottom, it had been mostly a matter of climbing inside and splashing about with the hose pipe. But the three pea ones looked much more difficult. Not only were they a lot bigger, but as far as he could see, there wasn't even so much as a pair of steps in sight, let alone a ladder, which would enable him to reach the topmost ones. Laying the hose pipe on the ground, he picked up a long piece of wood and poked it between two barrels at the bottom of the pile. Things had happened so quickly earlier in the day, he hadn't been able to take it all in. But he distinctly remembered the foreman advising him that the best place of all to start in a marmalade factory was at the bottom. As he levered the wood to and fro, several loud rumbling noises came from somewhere overhead. Now Paddington wasn't too keen on thunder, and he looked anxiously up at the sky as he quickened his pace. Some of the claps sounded much too close for his liking, and he wanted to get as much work as possible done before the storm finally broke. Had he but known it, Paddington wasn't the only one to feel uneasy about the sudden change in the weather. From his position on the platform, Sir Huntley Martin himself cast several glances skywards as he tried to speak. Although it was a warm day for the time of year, thunder in February was most unusual, and he didn't like the look of things at all. Oh, upon my soul, he boomed into the microphone. That's all we need. Sir Huntley Martin was beginning to look more and more unhappy at the way things were going. The day had started badly when the famous film star who had promised to perform the opening ceremony had fallen ill. And now to have a thunderstorm into the bargain seemed the final straw. Several times he tried to continue with his speech, but each time he opened his mouth, a loud rumble came from somewhere near at hand. Even the audience began to look uneasy, and from her position in the front row, Mrs Bird placed her umbrella at the ready. I wish someone would tell me where Paddington has got to, she said. I know he should have brought his Macintosh. If you ask me, said Mr. Brown, he's probably still inside the factory, digging into the marmalade store. If he doesn't hurry up, said Mrs. Brown, he'll miss the ceremony. And he'll be most upset if that happens. Mr. Brown turned his attention back to the platform. Yes, well, if this thunder gets any worse, he said, there won't be any ceremony to miss. Crikey! exclaimed Jonathan suddenly, pointing across the square towards the yard. Look! Good heavens! boomed Sir Huntley, following the direction of Jonathan's hand. It isn't thunder at all! It's barrels! Everyone stared in amazement as they took in the sight which met their eyes. Several barrels were already bumping their way across the square towards them, and even as Sir Huntley spoke, a number of others detached themselves from the top of the pile in the yard and fell with a loud crash to the ground. A look out! shouted the foreman. The whole lot's going in a minute! Almost before the words were out of his mouth, the rumble became a roar, and before the astonished gaze of the onlookers, the mountain of barrels collapsed and came cascading out through the yard gates. Most of them stopped some distance away, but several bounced dangerously near to the audience, and one in particular seemed to have a life of its own, as it spun round a couple of times and finally ended up with a loud crash against the side of the platform. Oh, mercy me, cried Mrs. Bird, as a familiar hat, followed by some equally familiar whiskers, peered out of the wreckage. It's Paddington. Well, that's, the, uh, that's the young bear I took on this morning exclaimed the foreman with surprise. The young bear you took on, repeated Sir Huntley, looking as if he could hardly believe his ears. But he's one of my guests. 
Oh, thank heaven you're safe, Bear, he continued, stepping down from the platform. I don't know what's gone wrong, but I should never have forgiven myself if you'd had a nasty accident on my premises. Oh, what a blessing you had the presence of mind to get inside one of the barrels, said Mrs. Bird. Otherwise, there's no knowing what might have happened. Oh, I was inside already, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington. I heard some claps, so I climbed inside in case I got struck by a boat. But what on earth happened? asked Sir Huntley. I, uh, I think I started at the bottom by mistake, said Paddington sadly, as he rose to his feet and dusted himself. He felt very much as if he'd been for a ride on a helter-skelter, a scenic railway and a dodgem car all rolled into one. And now that he was actually standing, it seemed even worse, for his paws felt as if they were sinking deeper into the ground with every step. Oh, careful, cried Mrs. Brown. Mind Sir Huntley's ceremonial cement. Sir Huntley's ceremonial cement, echoed Paddington, looking most surprised as he peered down at his feet. Sir Huntley Martin stepped forward hastily and lifted Paddington carefully out of the small square of wet concrete. Yes, well, I, uh, I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he boomed, holding up his hands for silence, uh, this is a good moment to declare our new uh, factory extension uh, well and truly open. <laughs> After all, he added amid applause, lots of factories in the world have been opened by film stars making their footprints in the cement outside, but I don't suppose <laughs> there are many that can boast some genuine bears or marks. <laughs> As the applause died away, Paddington examined the patch of cement again with interest. I could make a few more marks if you like, Sir Huntley, he said hopefully. <laughs> Bears are good at poor marks. Oh, there, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Bear, replied Sir Huntley tactfully. But I think we have uh, enough to be going on with. Enough's as good as a feast. <laughs> what? <laughs> and uh, talking of uh, feasts, he added, looking at his watch, uh, we're already late for tea and we don't want to miss that, do we? Uh, we've made some special new director's marmalade in honour of the occasion. Director's marmalade? exclaimed Paddington with interest. I don't think I've ever tasted any of that before. Yes, well, there's uh, <clears throat> more chunks, said Sir Huntley confidentially, as he led Paddington across the square towards the main building. I'd very much like your opinion on it, a bear. Paddington stood in the middle of the Browns' dining room and gazed around with interest. When Mrs. Bird had brought him his breakfast in bed that morning, He'd had his suspicions that something unusual was going on. Breakfast in bed on a weekday was a sure sign that Mrs. Bird wanted him out of the way. But not even the distant bumping noises which had been going on from quite an early hour had in any way prepared him for the sight which met his eyes. Normally the Browns' house was tidier than most, but on this particular morning the dining room looked very much as if a hurricane had recently passed through. The furniture had all been moved to one end, the carpet had been rolled up and was standing against one of the walls. There were no curtains at any of the windows, and the pictures had all been taken down. Even the grate was cold and empty, and the only heat came from an electric fire at one end of the room. I didn't know you were cleaning your springs, Mrs. Bird, he exclaimed, looking most surprised. No, dear, no, not cleaning our springs, repeated Mrs. Bird. Spring cleaning, quite a different matter. It means cleaning the whole house out from top to bottom, explained Mrs. Brown. It'll be your room next. We can't leave it a moment longer. Yes, and talking of leaving things a moment longer, said Mrs. Bird as she hurried out of the room, if we don't get a move on and buy that curtain material, we shan't have no dinner tonight. Now, where's that bear? I haven't given him his instructions yet. Here I am, Mrs. Bird, called Paddington, hurrying into the hall. Mrs. Bird looked at him suspiciously. There was a gleam in his eyes which she didn't like the look of at all. But fortunately for Paddington, she was in too much of a hurry to look deeply into the matter. Well, I've left you some cold sausages and a salad on a tray, she said, 
and there's a treacle pudding ready on the stove. Only mind you don't singe your whiskers when you light the gas. And don't let it boil dry. I don't want to find any nasty smells when I get home. Oh, thank you very much, Mrs Bird, said Paddington. Perhaps I, uh, I could do some tidying up while you're out, he added, hopefully, as he followed the others towards the front door. I've uh, never done any spring cleaning before. Mrs Brown and Mrs Bird exchanged glances. Hmm, you may do some dusting if you like, said Mrs Brown, but I shouldn't do too much tidying up. It's all rather heavy and you might strain yourself. I'm afraid we shall have to eat in the kitchen for a day or two, at least until Mr. Brown has cleaned the chimney, <laughs> though goodness knows when that'll be. After he closed the front door, Paddington hurried back down the hall with an excited gleam in his eyes. There was an idea stirring in the back of his mind to do with a large, interesting-looking box with a Barclay's label tied to the outside, which he'd seen standing by the dining-room fireplace. For some days, the word chimney had cropped up a number of times in the Brown household. It had all started when Mrs Bird opened the dining-room door one morning and found the room full of smoke. Shortly afterwards, Mr Brown spent some time on the telephone, only to announce that all the local chimney sweeps had so much work on their hands they were booked up for weeks to come. At the time, Paddington hadn't given the matter much thought. Well, it seemed rather a lot of fuss to make over a little bit of smoke. And after peering up the chimney once or twice, he decided there wasn't much to see anyway. Even when Mr Brown dropped a chance remark at breakfast one morning about doing it himself, he hadn't paid a great deal of attention. But the news that operations were about to commence, together with the arrival of the mysterious-looking box, had aroused his interest at last. The outside of the box exceeded his wildest dreams. Even the label was exciting. It was made up of a number of brightly coloured pictures called Easy Stages. And across the top in large capital letters were the words Sweep It Clean, the all-British do-it-yourself chimney sweep outfit. Underneath, in smaller print, the label went on to say that even a child of ten could make the dirtiest chimneys spotless in a matter of moments. To show how easy it all was, the first pictures had a small boy fitting the various bits and pieces together as he prepared to sweep his father's chimney. Paddington felt a slight pang of guilt as he lifted the lid of the box and peered inside. But he soon lost it again as he settled down in an armchair, dipping his paw into a jar of marmalade every now and then as he examined the contents. Although none of the pictures on the label mentioned anything about bears being able to sweep their chimneys, it made everything look so clear and simple. He began to wonder why anyone ever bothered to hire a real chimney sweep at all. One picture even showed a large bag labelled soot, standing next to a pile of silver coins, and followed it with the inscription, Make money in your spare time by selling soot to your neighbours for their garden. Now, Paddington couldn't quite picture Mr Curry, their next-door neighbour, actually paying for someone else's soot. But all the same, he began to feel that Mr Brown's outfit was very good value indeed. Inside the box, there was a large round brush, together with a number of long rods with metal ends, which screwed together to form one long pole. Underneath the rods was yet another compartment containing a sack full of soot and a sheet with two armholes, so that the person sweeping the chimney could fit it to the mantelpiece and work without getting the rest of the room dirty. Paddington tried putting his paws through the sheet, and after screwing the brush onto one of the rods, he spent several enjoyable minutes while he hurried round the room, poking it into various nooks and crannies. It was when he decided to test it up the chimney itself that a thoughtful expression gradually came over his face. The brush went up and down remarkably easily, and even with only one rod, the grate was full of soot in no time at all. Paddington grew more and more thoughtful as he shoveled the soot into the sack and then tried fixing a second rod to the first. Although Mrs Brown hadn't actually mentioned anything about sweeping the chimney, he felt sure it could easily come under the heading of dusting. <laughs>
Number 32 Windsor Gardens was a tall house, and as the bundle of rods by Paddington's side got smaller and smaller, so the pile of soot in the grate grew larger and larger. Several times he had to stop and clear it away to make room for his paws, as first the sack and then several of Mrs Bird's old grocery boxes became full to the brim. He was beginning to give up hope of ever reaching the top, when suddenly, without any warning, the brush freed itself, and he nearly fell over into the grate as he clung to the last of the rods. Paddington sat in the fireplace for a while, mopping his brow with the corner of the sheet, and then, after disappearing upstairs for a few moments, he hurried outside, carrying his binoculars. According to a note on the box lid, the exciting part about sweeping a chimney was always the moment when the brush popped out of the chimney pot, and he was particularly anxious to see it for himself. Carefully adjusting the glasses, he climbed the ladder which Mr Briggs the builder had left standing against the side of the house and peered up at the roof with a pleased expression on his face. The view through the binoculars of the brush poking out of Mr Brown's chimney pot almost exactly matched the picture on the box. Paddington spent some time drinking in the view, and then he climbed back down the ladder and hurried into the house wearing the air of a bear with a job well done. All in all, it had been a good morning's work, and he felt sure the Browns would be very pleased when they reached home and found how busy he'd been. Pulling the brush back down the chimney proved to be a lot easier than pushing it up had been, and it seemed only a matter of moments before he found himself reaching up behind the sheet for the last of the rods. It was as he disentangled himself from the sheet that a startled expression suddenly came over Paddington's face, and he nearly fell over backwards with surprise as he stared at the rod in his paw. He rubbed his eyes in case he'd got some soot in them by mistake, and then gazed at the end of the rod again. It was definitely the last one of the set, as he'd counted them all most carefully. But of the brush itself, there was nothing to be seen. After peering, hopefully up the chimney several times, Paddington sat down anxiously in the fireplace in order to consult the instructions on the box. As he lifted the lid, he suddenly caught sight of a large red label pasted to the bottom of the box. It had escaped his notice before, and as he read it, his eyes grew larger and larger. It said simply, Warning. After sweeping the chimney, great care must be taken when unscrewing rods. Otherwise, the brush may become detached. My brush become detached, exclaimed Paddington bitterly, addressing the world in general as he gazed at the rod in one paw and the box in the other. Apart from leaving the warning about the brush becoming detached until it was far too late, the only advice the notice seemed to give for when things did go wrong was contained in the four words, Consult your nearest dealer. Paddington sat in the fireplace with a mournful expression on his face. He felt sure that Barkridge's wouldn't be at all keen if he consulted them on the subject of Mr Brown's brush being stuck up his chimney. And he was equally certain that Mr Brown himself would be even less happy when he heard the news. In fact, after giving the matter a great deal of thought, the only way he could see to soften the blow at all was to clear up some of the mess and hope that while he did so, he might get an idea on the subject. Now, if earlier in the day, the Brown's dining room had given the impression of having been in the path of a hurricane, it now looked as if a belt of thick smog had passed through as well. Despite the dust sheet, everything seemed to be covered in a thin layer of soot. And looking round the room, Paddington decided that in more ways than one... He'd never seen things looking quite so black. <laughs> Mr Brown took his head out of the chimney and looked round at the others. Well, I can't understand it, he exclaimed. That's the third time I've tried to light the fire. Keeps going out. Mrs Brown picked up a newspaper and began waving some of the smoke away. Oh, there's obviously been another fall of soot, she said. It's everywhere. If you ask me, the chimney's blocked. I told you it needed sweeping. Well, how could I sweep it? said Mr Brown crossly. The outfit only arrived this morning. The Browns grouped themselves unhappily round the fireplace and stared at the pile of used matches. Yes, and there's another thing continued Mr. Brown. I'm sending it straight back to Barkridge's. It's filthy dirty and there isn't even a brush. I mean, you, you can't sweep a chimney without a brush. Perhaps Paddington's borrowed it for something, 
said Mrs. Brown vaguely. I can't find him anywhere. Harrington, echoed Mr. Brown. What would he want with a brush? There's no knowing, said Mrs. Bird ominously. Mrs. Bird didn't like the signs of a hurried cleaning up she'd noticed in the dining room or the various sooty paw marks which she'd discovered during a quick glance round the rest of the house. But in view of the look on Mr. Brown's face, she wisely kept her thoughts to herself. He hasn't touched his treacle pudding, said Mrs. Brown, and that's most unusual. Blow Paddington's treacle pudding, replied Mr. Brown. I'm more worried about the fire. Mrs. Brown opened the French windows and looked into the garden. Oh, well, perhaps Mr. Briggs can help, she said. He's just come back. In answer to Mrs. Brown's call, Mr. Briggs, the builder, came into the dining room and put his ear to the chimney with an experienced air. Jack Doge, he said after a moment. You've got a Jack Doge nest in your pot. If you listen, you can hear him coughing. Coughing? exclaimed Mrs. Bird. I didn't know Jack Doge coughed. You'd cough, Mum, said Mr. Briggs, if someone tried to light a fire under your nest. But don't you worry, he continued, opening up Mr. Brown's cleaning set. I'll let it out in a jiffy. The Browns stood back and watched, while Mr. Briggs began pushing the rods up the chimney. Good job you had these, he went on. Otherwise it might have been a rare job. <laughs> Mr. Briggs' face became redder and redder as the rods got harder to push but at long last he gave a final upward heave and there was a loud crashing noise as something heavy landed in the grate. There you are, he announced triumphantly. What did I tell you? Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses and peered at the round, black, bristly object lying on the hearth. Yes, and it looks a funny sort of bird's nest to me, he said. In fact, if you ask me, it's more like the brush out of a chimney sweeping outfit. Here yeah, you're quite right said Mr. Briggs, scratching his head. It's a brush, all right. Mr. Briggs began to look even more puzzled as he picked up the object and examined it more closely. It seems to be in some sort of container, he exclaimed. That's not a container, said Mrs. Brown. It's Paddington's hat. Good heavens, so it is, exclaimed Mr. Brown. But what's it doing up the chimney? And with my brush inside it. Oh, mercy me! interrupted Mrs. Bird, pointing towards the window. Look! The others turned and followed the direction of her gaze. I can't see anything, said Mr. Brown. Is anything the matter? asked Mrs. Brown, looking at her housekeeper with some concern. You've gone quite white. I thought I saw a chimney pot go past the window, exclaimed Mrs. Bird, reaching for her smelling salts. Mr. and Mrs. Brown exchanged glances. Normally, Mrs. Bird was the sanest member of the family, and it was most unusual for her to have hallucinations. I, uh, I think you'd better sit down, said Mr. Brown, drawing up a chair. Perhaps the excitement's been uh, too much for you. It's all right, Mrs. Bird, came a familiar, if somewhat muffled voice from the dining room doorway. It's only me. If Mrs. Bird had been taken by surprise a moment before, the others looked even more amazed as they turned and stared at the black object before them. In place of his usual headgear, Paddington was wearing what appeared to be half a chimney pot, which covered his ears and came down over his eyes like an oversized top hat. I'm, uh, I'm afraid it broke off when Mr. Briggs poked his rods up, he explained, when the noise had died down. But what on earth were you doing up on the roof in the first place? asked Mr. Brown. I was dusting the chimney said Paddington sadly. The brush got detached by mistake and I was trying to rescue it. Paddington? echoed Mr Briggs disbelievingly as he began levering the pot off. Did you say Paddington? Looks more like Clapham Junction to me. <laughs> Proper mess easy. Paddington looked most offended at Mr Briggs' words as he sat on the floor rubbing his ears. It had been bad enough losing Mr Brown's brush up the chimney in the first place but then to get his head stuck inside the pot and be mistaken for a bird's nest into the bargain seemed the unkindest cut of all. I know one thing, said Mrs. Bird sternly. You're going straight up to the bathroom. We must have the dirtiest bear within 50 miles. Mr. Briggs gave a sudden chuckle as he looked at the others. <laughs> I'll say this much, he remarked, pouring oil on troubled waters. 
You may not have the cleanest bear within 50 miles, but I'm willing to bet there ain't a cleaner chimney. The day after his adventure with the chimney sweeping outfit, Paddington hurried down to the Portobello market with his shopping basket on wheels in order to tell his friend, Mr. Gruber, all about it. Mr. Gruber chuckled as he busied himself with a saucepan on the small stove at the back of his shop. <laughs> I wish I had known, Mr. Brown, he said. I couldn't let you have several books on the subject. Yes, well, I don't think they'd have helped me very much, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington sadly. I mean, it's a bit difficult reading books when you've got your head stuck in a chimney pot, especially with paws. Mr. Gruber chuckled again as he joined Paddington on the horsehair sofa. Oh, well, thank goodness the weather seems to be on the change at last, he said, looking out of his shop window as he handed over a large mug of cocoa. I can't say I'm sorry. Paddington nodded his agreement from behind a cloud of cocoa steam while he divided the morning supply of buns. Although he liked the winter, spring with its promise of even better things to come, always seemed much more exciting. Apart from that, when there was too much ice or snow about, it wasn't always possible to get as far as the Portobello Road, and he missed his morning chats with Mr Gruber over their elevenses. Paddington was fond of Mr Gruber's old antique shop with its rows of books and gleaming piles of copper and brass, but of late the weather had been too cold for anything more than an occasional visit. In fact, the only good thing about it all was that in the meantime, he had built up a big reserve of bun money at the baker's, where he had a standing order. I've been hoping we might be able to have one of our little trips, said Mr. Gruber. Once the good weather comes, I shall be busy with all the tourists. <laughs> it seems ages since they went out together. Paddington wiped the cocoa stains from his whiskers. Oh, yes, please, Mr. Gruber, he exclaimed. I should like that. Mr. Gruber looked thoughtful. I, uh, I notice a new travel firm has opened up in the market, he said. They're advertising coach trips. They seem to do a very good mystery tour for 40p. A mystery tour? exclaimed Paddington with interest. I don't think I've been on one of those before. Where do they go? <laughs> said Mr. Gruber. They don't tell you. That's the mystery. But they do say it ends up with a visit to a famous London landmark. It sounds very good value, said Paddington, doubtfully. But I don't think I've got 40p, unless they'd uh, take buns instead. Mr. Gruber coughed. I don't think it will uh, come to that, Mr. Brown, he said. In fact, he continued hastily, not wishing to embarrass Paddington. Uh, talking of buns, you've kept me so well supplied over the years. I, I think it's about time I stood to treat for a change. <laughs> it would give me great pleasure if you would come along. As my guest. Well, thank you, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington gratefully. That's very kind of you. Mr. Gruber stood up and crossed the shop to his cash drawer. Oh, that's settled then, he said, handing Paddington a one-pound note. There's no time like the present, and if you have nothing else arranged, you could go this afternoon. Perhaps you'd like to book up for both of us on your way home. <laughs> The shop was called Alf Price Coach Tours, and as far as he could see, it looked even better value for money than Mr. Gruber's description had led him to expect. On the pavement outside, a large blackboard headed Today's Special bore the words Afternoon Mystery Tour 40p. <laughs> <laughs> 
and some of the pictures in the window looked even more interesting. Several described day trips to the seaside. Others were all about coach holidays in various parts of the country, and one in particular which caught his eye showed scenes from a bumper continental tour called the 99 Special. Paddington spent some time studying the last advertisement. In fact, he became so absorbed in it, he didn't notice a shadowy figure standing in the shop doorway, and he was taken by surprise when the man addressed him. Good morning, sir, said the man, rubbing his hands with invisible soap. Can I interest you in one of our tours? Oh, yes, please, said Paddington importantly, following the man into the shop. I'd like a two, please. A two? Oh, echoed the man, looking most impressed, as he ushered Paddington towards a deep leather armchair, standing next to a table laden with pamphlets. And which one in particular takes your fancy? Uh, I can thoroughly recommend our... Uh, Ninety-nine special. And nine different countries in nine days, he continued, brushing an imaginary speck of dust from the arm of Paddington's chair. And you need never get out of the coach. <laughs> Good. The normal price is fifty guineas, but I'm sure we could arrange special all-in bear rates if you're having to. Fifty guineas? exclaimed Paddington in alarm. But I only wanted 240p once for the afternoon mystery tour. The smile disappeared as if by magic from the man's face as he stared at Paddington's pound note. Yeah, he said nastily. Are you taking the mickey? Uh, no, said Paddington earnestly. Only Mr. Gruber. And I'm, I'm not taking him. He's taking me. Because it's his treat. The man took a deep breath and disappeared behind the counter. I'll trouble you to get out of that armchair. He said nastily. It's a new one, and we don't want to get no nasty stains on it. Here you are, he continued, handing Paddington two tickets in exchange for the pound note. Coach leaves at two o'clock sharp, and here's your 20p change. 20 pence, exclaimed Paddington. I think you've made a mistake. A mistake, repeated the man. Two tickets of 40p is 80p. 80p from a pound is 20 but it says outside your trips are half price, replied Paddington hotly. Half price, echoed the man. Just you show me where, young fellow me bear. Paddington hurried out of the shop and pointed to the sign over the door. There you are, he exclaimed. The man stared up at the notice for a moment and then back at Paddington. Here, Alf, he called, putting his head inside the shop door. There's a young bear out here taking your name in vain. That isn't Alf Price, he said, turning back to Paddington. That's Alf Price, of Alf Price Coach Tours. He's the owner. And if you want my advice, you'll be on your way before he comes out. Very sensitive is Alf. Paddington gave the man a long, hard stare, and then beat a hasty retreat in the direction of Windsor Gardens, casting some anxious glances over his shoulder as he hurried along, clutching the two coach tickets tightly in his paw in case anything else happened. Ninety-nine special indeed, said Mrs. Brown when he told the others all about the morning's events. It ought not to be allowed, trying to get their hands on a young bear's savings like that. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird. I don't think we need have any worries on that score. Anyone who gets their hands on that bear's savings deserves every penny. It's what I'd call earning money the hard way. Paddington looked most offended at Mrs. Bird's remarks as he hurried upstairs in order to get ready for his outing. All the same, there were so many preparations to make, he soon forgot about his nasty experiences in the coach office, and by the time the afternoon arrived, he was looking unusually spick and span as he made his way back down the Portobello Road. Paddington always enjoyed an outing, and it was with an air of excitement that he climbed into the waiting coach and settled himself comfortably in the front seat alongside Mr. Gruber. Mr. Gruber had brought several guidebooks with him, and as they sped through the London streets, he pointed out a number of the more important landmarks, explaining all about them as they came into view. The time passed quickly, but after they had been travelling for about an hour, Mr. Gruber began to look thoughtful. Do you know, Mr. Brown, he said, studying a map as they turned a corner and began to slow down. 
I have a feeling you're in for a nice surprise. I do believe we're going to visit somewhere very unusual. Before Mr. Gruber had time to explain matters any further, the coach driver began marshalling his passengers out onto the pavement and then led them towards a large building standing to one side of a busy main street. Mr. Gruber paused just inside the entrance in order to buy a guidebook, and while he was waiting, Paddington stood politely to one side and gazed around with interest. While he was looking, he suddenly caught sight of a small kiosk standing nearby, and an excited gleam came into his eyes as he took in the display of brightly coloured postcards on the counter, several of which showed views of sights they had passed that very afternoon. Paddington had enjoyed his outing no end, and knowing Mr Gruber's fondness for pictures, it seemed a good chance to repay him for some of his kindness. Carefully making sure no one was watching, Paddington took some money out of the secret compartment in his suitcase and then hurried across the hall. Ida, like two large souvenir postcards, please, he announced, tapping importantly on the counter. Some of the special coloured ones. Being rather short, Paddington was used to having trouble with counters, but even he began to get more and more impatient as the lady in the kiosk stared with a fixed expression on her face at some distant object above his head. He looked round anxiously as the coach party began moving forwards towards some stairs at the back of the hall, and several times he gave the figure behind the counter some extra hard stares. But for once, the ones he got back seemed even harder still. Ah, I was going to buy some souvenirs, he explained, as Mr Gruber came hurrying up to see what was the matter. But I can't make anyone hear. Mr Gruber looked rather upset. Oh dear, Mr Brown, he said. I doubt if you will. <laughs> I think she's made of wax. Paddington peered over the edge of the counter. Made of wax, he said hotly. I've never heard of anyone being made of wax before. Mr Gruber chuckled. <laughs> You'll find a lot of people like that in here, Mr. Brown, he said. This is Madame Tussauds. It's a Wexworks Museum. <laughs> this must be one of their little jokes. Now, I think the real lady is over there. Mr. Gruber pointed towards the other end of the counter as he went on to explain all about the museum. They not only have models, do you see, of all the famous people in history, he said, handing the girl some money in exchange for two postcards. They have a lot of other figures made of wax as well. Some of them, indeed, are so lifelike, it's difficult to tell whether they are real or not. I'm sure you're not the first one to be caught napping, Mr. Brown. Paddington listened carefully as he followed Mr. Gruber towards the crowd on the stairs. Now that matters had been explained to him, he began to notice quite a few figures standing motionless in the hall. Near the entrance, there was an unusually still-looking policeman, and halfway up the stairs stood another man in uniform with his hand outstretched in front of him, looking for all the world like one of the statues Mr. Gruber had pointed out on their trip. I think we must have picked the wrong day, Mr. Brown, said Mr. Gruber, breaking into his thoughts. Half London seems to be in front of us. Paddington gasped his agreement as Mr. Gruber disappeared in a flurry of people. From where he was standing, it felt very much as if the other half of London was behind him as well. And to make matters worse, he just made the unhappy discovery that a half-opened bar of chocolate he'd brought in case of an emergency was beginning to melt in his paw with the heat. Although he often got himself into a mess, Paddington was a tidy-minded bear, and he looked round for somewhere to put the sticky remains before too much of it dripped onto the floor. By now, the crowd was too thick to lift his hat, let alone open his suitcase, and he was just giving up hope of ever finding anywhere to leave it when he found himself standing next to the figure in uniform he'd noticed earlier. Without waiting to consider the matter, Paddington pressed the ball of chocolate into the outstretched hand and then turned to look for Mr Gruber. As he did so, a loud voice rang out over the noise of the crowd. Here, cried the voice. Who did this? Paddington turned and then nearly jumped out of his skin as he caught sight of the man in uniform holding up a chocolate-covered hand for everyone to see. The man gazed at Paddington suspiciously. Is this yours, bear? he said. I, uh, I thought you were a waxworks, exclaimed Paddington, looking most upset. 
He stared round desperately for help, but Mr. Gruber was nowhere to be seen. Boy, shouted the man. Come back. Stop that bear. But Paddington was halfway down the stairs. He didn't like the look of things at all. Already several of the doorkeepers were looking in his direction, and as he squeezed his way past the people trying to get up, he peered round anxiously for somewhere to hide. Holding on tightly to his suitcase, he hurried across the hall in the direction of some more stairs. The voice of the man in uniform was getting louder and louder, and there wasn't time to read the words over the opening, but it seemed the only spot left where there was no one to bar his way. When he reached the bottom of the stairs, Paddington found himself in a large room rather like a dungeon. It was much darker than it had been in the other part of the building, but as far as he could make out, he was standing in a long stone corridor which had a line of smaller rooms opening out along one side, each of which contained a number of figures. The voices behind him were getting nearer with every passing second, and he just had time to climb over a chain and take up a pose in the shadows at the back of one of the rooms when a crowd of officials rushed into the cellar, looking in all directions. <laughs> As the minutes ticked by, Paddington began to wish he'd picked on a lying down pose, or even a sitting up one. Standing on one leg with outstretched paws was difficult enough at the best of times, but when it was in a hot cellar with no time in which to get comfortable, matters became very difficult indeed. At long last, the shouting died away amid a clatter of feet as the men disappeared back up the stairs. Paddington heaved a sigh of relief, but before he had time to blink, let alone move his paws, some new voices broke the silence which followed. They got nearer and nearer until suddenly they stopped outside his room. It says Charlie Peace, the murderer in the catalogue, announced a man's voice, but I never thought he had fur. If that's Charlie Peace, replied a woman, I'm the Queen of Sheba. Besides, where's his number? All the rest on them have got numbers. Perhaps it's a friend, said a child's voice. Horrible, complained the woman. They all look as bad as one another to me. Don't know which of them is worse. I shouldn't look if I were you, Lil. Horrible it may be, interrupted the man, but it's very lifelike. Fancy making all them whiskers out of wax. <laughs> it's a wonder they don't drop off with the heat. Paddington opened his eyes and stared at the group outside the room. He was getting a bit fed up with the way things were going. More and more people were joining the party with every passing moment, and by now the corridor was crowded with curious onlookers. It all seemed a great deal of fuss and bother to get into, simply because he'd wanted to get rid of some chocolate remains. Charlie Peace, he exclaimed, raising his hat. I'm not Charlie Peace. I'm Paddington Brown from darkest Peru. If Paddington had been surprised when the man on the stairs had sprung into life, his audience in the cellar seemed even more taken aback at this sudden turn of events. When he caught sight of the look on their faces, Paddington closed his eyes and gave several hurried snores as he took up his pose again. But it was already much too late. The air was filled with cries of alarm from the ones in the front row and a buzz of excited conversation from those at the back who were straining to see what was going on. Just as the noise began to reach its height, the sound of heavy boots added itself to the general hubbub, and a moment later, Paddington felt a heavy hand on his shoulder. Gotcha, said a triumphant voice. If I'm not mistaken, you're the young bear what mistook me for a dustbin on the stairs. Paddington opened his eyes and looked up at the dark blue uniform. I didn't know you were real, he explained. I only wanted to get rid of my chocolate remains. Fifty years I've been here, man and boy, said the man bitterly, holding up his hands for everyone to see. And I've never had a bear's remains deposited on me before. We'll have to see what the manager's got to say about this little matter. I dare say he'll want to take down your particulars. Take down my particulars? exclaimed Paddington, looking more and more upset. That's what I said, remarked the man. I don't know about him being a Charlie Peace... He continued, addressing the crowd in reply to someone's question. He's a disturber of the peace, all right. 
While the man was talking, Paddington got down on his paws and knees and pulled his hat well down over his head. A few seconds later, the sound of shouting broke out once more in Madame Tussauds, only this time it was directed towards the stairs, as a small brown figure disappeared up them as fast as its legs would go. Paddington believed in getting his money's worth, but he'd had quite enough adventures for one day, even for a 40p bargain mystery tour. Yes, well, it's all highly irregular, said Jonathan's headmaster as he addressed the small group of people standing on the cricket pitch. He's not even an old bear, let alone an old boy. He looked distastefully towards the boundary, where a small brown figure in an odd and rather disreputable-looking hat sat dipping a paw into what looked like a large earthenware jar. Well, the old boys are one man short, sir, said the sportsmaster, and the crowd's getting a bit restive, you know. If we don't start soon, there won't be time for a match at all. Yes, we could ask him, I suppose, said the headmaster grudgingly. He might not want to play, of course, he added, brightening slightly at the thought. He looks very comfortable when he is. Oh, he will, said Jonathan loyally. Old Paddington likes anything new, and he's never played cricket before. Yes, we can but try, said the sportsmaster, interrupting hastily as he led the way across the field. After all, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. As organiser-in-chief of the afternoon's cricket match in aid of the new school pavilion, the sportsmaster wore a worried look on his face. In the beginning, it had promised to be a particularly enjoyable occasion. A team of old boys, captained by Mr Brown, had challenged a team from the sixth form, and no lesser person than Mr Alf Duckham, the famous England cricketer, had agreed to act as umpire. Viewing the large crowd that had turned up to see the event, the sportsmaster had had high hopes of raising a lot of money, and the last-minute news that the old boys were one player short had come as a bitter blow. Like a drowning man clutching at a straw, he had eagerly seized on Jonathan's suggestion that Paddington might like to turn up for the game. But as they neared the boundary line, even he began to have second thoughts on the matter. Paddington looked most surprised when he saw the party approaching his deck chair. After the first excitement of arriving at Farrowfield had died down, he'd been glad of the chance to sit down and rest. Although it was only Jonathan's first term at his father's old school, Paddington's fame had gone before him, and his paws felt quite limp after all the shaking and making marks in autograph books they had done. Apart from that, he was beginning to feel the effects of several visits to the school tuck shop, not to mention two extra-large helpings of suet pudding, which he'd eaten at lunch. Um, how do you do, bear, said the headmaster, taking hold of Paddington's outstretched paw rather gingerly. Very well, thank you, replied Paddington politely, raising his hat with his other paw. The headmaster returned Paddington's gaze doubtfully. It was a warm afternoon, and there were a number of very odd and sticky-looking stains about Paddington's person, as well as some old suet pudding crumbs which he didn't like the look of at all. Um, uh, we were, uh, you know, just wondering if you'd care to turn out for the old boys this afternoon, he said gruffly. Turn out for the old boys, exclaimed Paddington, looking even more surprised. Yes, they're one man short in their team, explained Jonathan. Oh, yes, please, said Paddington eagerly. I think I should like that. I've never played cricket before. Mr. Alf Duckham gave a cough from somewhere at the back of the group. Perhaps we'd better toss up to see who's going in first, he said, taking a coin from his pocket. Would you like to do it, Bear? Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Duckham, said Paddington gratefully. It's a bit difficult with paws, but I'll have a go. While the others stood back and watched, Paddington took the coin and after placing it carefully on top of one of his paws, gave it a quick flick. Aye, well, that was a very good toss, Bear, said Alf Duckham approvingly, as he bent down and peered at the ground. Quite professional. <laughs> now all we have to do is find it again. It must be somewhere, said the headmaster crossly a moment or so later as he got down on his hands and knees and joined the others on the grass. Oh, it's all right, it's all right, cried Paddington suddenly when the excitement was at its height. <laughs> 
I've got it. <laughs> it was uh, stuck to my paw by mistake. Stuck to your paw by mistake, repeated the headmaster, breathing heavily. Am I hearing a right? I'm afraid I had some marmalade on it, explained Paddington, holding up his paw for everyone to see. <laughs> I forgot to wipe it off after breakfast. Yes, well, I think, uh, said the sportsmaster tactfully, as a loud snort came from the headmaster's direction, that we'd better adjourn to the pavilion and make a start. Though where we're going to find any pads to fit, he added, taking a closer look at Paddington, is quite another matter. If anything, the sportsmaster looked even more worried than he had done a few minutes before. He had a nasty feeling in the back of his mind that if there was one thing worse than having a team of only ten old boys, it might well prove to be that of having a team made up of ten old boys plus a young bear into the bargain. <laughs> Browns sat in a glum group on the boundary. Things were beginning to look very black indeed for the old boys in the match against the school. Harrowfield batted first, and by the middle of the afternoon, they had declared, leaving their opponents 150 runs to score in a little over two hours. Now, with less than 20 minutes to go, wickets were falling fast and furiously, and a number of the spectators were already beginning to leave the ground. Even Mrs Bird, who knew less about cricket than any of them, could see that things were far from well. Perhaps Paddington will be able to score a few, she remarked hopefully as she looked up from her knitting. What, with over 20 needed, said Jonathan. He's last man in. The old boys don't stand a chance. With both Paddington and his father in the old boys team, Jonathan wasn't quite sure which side to applaud. But even he managed to raise a genuine groan a few minutes later, as yet another loud, How's that? from the field, was followed by a burst of clapping from the school supporters. Oh, crikey, that's it, he exclaimed. There goes Dad's wicket. Oh, it's Paddington's turn now. Seventeen needed and only fifteen minutes to go. Oh, dear, said Mrs Brown nervously. I do hope he doesn't stand in the way of the ball. It looks very hard to me. Oh, don't worry, replied Jonathan ominously. It's Smasher Knowles, the demon of the upper six bowling. He's a nasty piece of work. Nobody likes him, but he's a jolly fast bowler. <laughs> Paddington won't even see the ball. Well, there he is now, said Mrs Brown, as a familiar figure came hurrying down the pavilion steps, and another, much louder burst of applause went round the ground. I do wish he wouldn't insist on wearing that old hat of his, remarked Mrs Bird. I'm sure it isn't quite the thing in an old boys' cricket match. Uh, best of luck, Paddington, said Mr Brown as he met him on the way in. Now, don't forget... Watch the ball, and whatever you do, keep a straight bat, uh, and have a good look around the field. See where the captain's placed his men. There's a silly mid off, and he's got a short leg. Paddington began to look more and more confused as he listened to Mr Brown's advice, and he nearly fell over backwards at the last piece of information. What? he exclaimed, looking round at the other players with interest. The silly mid off's got a short leg. Mr Brown opened his mouth as if he were about to say something but changed his mind. Good luck, he called, as Paddington hurried off in the direction of the wicket with a determined expression on his face. All in all, Paddington didn't think much of cricket as a game. He had spent over two hours in the field when the other side had been batting, and the ball had only come near him twice. The first time, it had been so far over his head he'd hardly been able to see it, and the second time, it had taken him completely by surprise when it had landed in his lap while he was busy testing a jar of marmalade. Despite several pleas from the older spectators that he'd managed to get a paw to it, Alf Duckham had been forced to say that it wasn't really a catch, and Paddington had been most upset. Now that he was actually standing at the wicket, he was beginning to have second and even third thoughts on the subject. Everything looked much bigger than it had done from the pavilion. There were far too many people standing nearby ready to catch him out for his liking. And when he caught sight of the expression on Smasher Knowles' face as he stood fingering the ball, he felt even less keen 
on the whole affair. Paddington crouched down, and as the demon bowler of the upper sixth thundered down the pitch towards him, he hurriedly filled the gap between his pads with the bat and closed his eyes while he waited for the worst to happen. Smasher Knowles stopped in his run. I can't bowl if he hides behind his pads, he exclaimed crossly. I can't even see the batsman, let alone the wicket. Alf Duckham signalled the bowler back to his place. Everyone has their own way of playing the game, he said sternly. This young bear is entitled to his. Unaware of the reason for the delay, the Browns sat anxiously watching the events on the field as the bowler turned and once again hurled himself down the pitch towards Paddington. Oh, he looks in a jolly bad temper, said Jonathan. This is it. I can't watch. Can't watch, said Mrs Bird. I know something awful's going to happen. Just as Mrs Bird closed her eyes, there was a loud click of a ball hitting wood and a roar of surprise swept round the ground. Good heavens, cried someone behind her. That young bear's hit a six. Bravo! Everyone rose to their feet and stared in amazement at the sight of the ball sawing over the heads of the crowd on the far side of the field. It had taken everyone completely by surprise, and for some odd reason, even the fieldsmen were looking in the wrong direction. Paddington, as he picked himself up from the ground, looked the most surprised of all. Apart from feeling as if he'd been kicked by a mule, he wasn't at all sure what had happened. But a pleased expression came over his face as he listened to the applause, and he raised his hat several times to the crowd. He's got the bat the wrong way round, yelled Smasher Knowles, pointing an accusing finger at Paddington. How can you tell where the ball's going if he doesn't hold his flipping bat properly? It might go anywhere. Alf Duckham scratched his head. Well, I don't know that there's anything in the rules saying you must hit the ball with the flat side of the bat, he said. Can't say as I've ever come across it before. I, I think we'd better play on. Smasher Knowles glared at Paddington and then turned and made his way back up the pitch. He didn't even hit the ball, he grumbled. I hit the bat. Two more balls for this over, said Jonathan. Oh, I wonder if Paddington can hold out. Crikey, he exclaimed, jumping to his feet again as another burst of applause swept the ground. A four. Good old Paddington. Even Mrs Bird was sitting on the edge of her chair with excitement at the sudden change in the game. Oh, he, he can't possibly do it again, she exclaimed, as Smasher Knowles turned to make his run for the last ball of the over. He jolly well has, cried someone over the applause. Another four. <laughs> Fourteen off, one over. Bravo, Bear. Best innings of the day. There's just time for two more overs, said Jonathan excitedly as he looked at the pavilion clock. And the old boys only need three runs to win. If the other chap can keep the bowling away from Paddington, they stand a chance. I'm sure Paddington could hit another one of them fours, said Mrs Bird vaguely. He seems very good at them. It's old Parkinson bowling now, said Jonathan. He's a spin bowler. Uh, even Paddington won't get any fours off him. The crowd relaxed as the field settled down, and the bowler ran up to deliver the first ball of the over. Gradually, an air of gloom descended once again, as Paddington's partner made a wild swing at the first four balls and missed them completely. I know Paddington could do better, said Mrs Brown. He's hit one, cried Jonathan excitedly. Come on, Paddington, run! The crowd watched with bated breath as the two figures ran between the wickets. Paddington seemed to be having some kind of trouble with his pads, and he was still only halfway down the pitch when his partner was safely home. Paddington's pads had been something of a problem right from the start. Bear's legs being rather short, there had been none of the right size, and in the end, the sportsmaster had trimmed the ends off an old pair he'd found in the pavilion. But even so, they were far from satisfactory, and the tops flapped up and down, banging Paddington on his knees as he struggled to make his run. Whoa, said Jonathan, sinking back to the ground as Paddington reached his crease in the nick of time. That was a near thing. Two more wanted to win. <laughs> Best of luck there.
whispered Alf Duckham as Paddington took up his position. Yeah, be careful now. It's young Parkinson bowling. They, they tell me he comes from Australia. So watch his googlies. Watch his googlies, repeated Paddington, peering down the pitch with interest as the bowler ran towards him. How do you do? He called out, raising his hat politely. I'm Paddington Brown, and I come from darkest Peru. The crowd fell silent as the ball left the bowler's hand, and then a murmur of surprise went round the ground. That's funny, said Jonathan. What's happened to it? Everyone craned their necks in an effort to see what was going on, as first the fieldsman and then Alf Duckham began searching the ground round the wicket. Well, it must be somewhere, said Alf Duckham. A ball can't just disappear into thin air. Any idea where you hit it, Bear? Paddington reached up and felt the top of his head. I don't think I did hit it, Mr Duckham, he said vaguely. I think it must have hit me. I've got a bruise under my hat. A bruise under your hat, repeated Alf Duckham, looking most concerned. Here, let me see. As he felt under Paddington's hat, a strange look came over Alf Duckham's face. Not into bruise, he exclaimed, withdrawing his hand. It's the ball. Oh, dear, said Paddington. It must have gone inside my hat by mistake when I raised it just now. Alf Duckham took a deep breath. Hmm. End of the over, he called, signalling to the players to change sides again. Oh, that's torn it, groaned Jonathan. Trust old Paddington to do a thing like that. Now there's only time for one more over and it's smash a Knoll's turn again. And they say cricket's a dull game, exclaimed Mrs Bird. Yes, not when Paddington's playing, said Mr Brown. If only they can get another two runs. Mr Brown stood with his hands ready to applaud as play began but they got noticeably lower and lower, as first one ball and then another whistled past Paddington's partner, untouched by the bat. Oh dear, last ball of the day coming up, he groaned. He must hit this one. He has too, cried Jonathan as a loud click came from the field. Come on, Paddington, run. One more for a tie, two for a win. Other voices added themselves to Jonathan's, and within a matter of moments the whole ground was in an uproar. From his position in the centre of the pitch, Paddington struggled on, oblivious to it all. Amongst the general hubbub, he could vaguely catch the sound of his name, and he remembered seeing his partner pass him several times, going in opposite directions. But he was much too busy trying to stand up, let alone run, as his pads slipped lower and lower down his legs. Once, he even felt someone pick him up and point him in the right direction, but beyond that, everything seemed like a bad dream, as he tried to move his legs, and nothing happened. No one on the field was more surprised than he was when at long last the wickets loomed up ahead and he found himself safely home. Well, said Mrs Brown, what happens now? Paddington's run one and his partner's run three. Oh, it'll be a tie, said Mr Brown. They'll just have to count Paddington's one. But on the field, Alf Duckham, entering very much into the spirit of the game, was having different ideas on the subject. Well, I think... He announced, holding up his hand for silence. In view of all the circumstances, we'll award the old boys one and a half runs and give them the game. Mr Duckham's announcement was greeted by a storm of applause from spectators and players alike. And even Smasher Knowles was seen to be clapping with the rest. Hear, hear, echoed the headmaster as he came onto the field. Very fair decision. Trifle unusual, of course. Not quite in the book of rules but very fair. The headmaster of Farrowfield looked very pleased with himself at the unexpected success of the day's activities. The excitement towards the end had been so great that contributions towards the new Cricket Pavilion Fund were pouring in, and he hurried over to shake Paddington by the paw. I was a... I was wondering, Bear, he said, hopefully, when the applause had died down, if you'd care to turn out for the old boys next year. You see, we're sadly in need of a new swimming pool. Paddington stood mopping his brow for a moment while he considered the matter from all angles. Although he had enjoyed parts of the game very much indeed, the ball had come much too close to his whiskers at times for his liking, and on the few occasions when he'd actually touched it, it had felt very hard indeed. In the end, it was Alf Duckham who came to his rescue and decided matters for him. Aye, well, if you want my advice, Bear, he said wisely, I should retire, you know, while you're still at your peak. After all, there aren't many cricketers who can say they've scored an average of 14 runs a match, especially off one over. <laughs>
And you don't want to spoil a record like that. Uh, 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 uh. 